I want to talk about Susanna Clarke's new novel, Piranesi, because I really enjoyed it, because I think it's got real genius. It's about Owen Barfield, in part, and I'd even go so far as to say it's an important read in our modern world, and so would like to see whether you get that too. It's set in a vast labyrinthine house of marble halls, thousands of them, and it features tides and birds and a few flashes of the sky, a handful of the dead, and is occupied by Piranesi, who loves the place and is loved by it. He's there with another character called The Other, who we become aware pretty quickly is manipulating Piranesi, but Piranesi doesn't mind. He loves the house and is loved by it. So the mystery is how this situation has come about. The joy of reading the book right from the get-go is the pleasure that Piranesi experiences too, but it has a kind of darkness. And just as a spoiler alert, I won't tell about the plot in this discussion, but there will inevitably be hints and suggestions about what might happen. But you know, the really important thing about this book is not actually what happens, but how it happens. It will be one of those books to read and reread and understand its meaning as it gives up its insights and its felt sense of things, which is its real genius. So to say something more about that, I'm going to read it at four levels, borrowing from the ancient hermeneutical enterprise of understanding things, first of all, at a literal level to kind of ground it, but realizing that doesn't exhaust things at all. Then at the allegorical or moral level, which teaches a few things, but again, seems to miss the main spirit or point. Then thirdly, at the tropological level, where a work of art or a story, a symbol, starts to unravel the world that you think you know to launch you into a new world. And then finally at the anagogic, which is the divine or complete perspective, which I think Piranesi leads us towards. So first of all, the literal. This is the way that the book has been read in most of the reviews that I've read. So it's described as the perfect lockdown fantasy, as if Rather than just being trapped in your house, you were trapped in a dream, and it's so very pleasant for that reason. Um, it's noted that Susanna Clarke herself has been very ill with a chronic fatigue syndrome, and so maybe this is a kind of artful version of um, Sontag's illness as metaphor. Um, it's a way of coping with what has happened to her. Another way it's been described is as a perfect take on the modern world, as if we're all melancholic souls, becoming a bit obsessive, as Piranesi seems to be in this literal reading. Um, he counts people, he counts the halls, um, or he uses techniques seemingly borrowed from positive psychology, like journaling, to try to make sense of things. That's what this literal reading might assume. Um, Another reflection is that it's about art and literature itself, you know, art for art's sake, literature for literature's sake, showing what's beautiful out of what we can make, um, or providing a kind of com comfort or consolation in an otherwise comfortless world. Another way I've, I've heard it reviewed is as self-referential fantasy literature, a sort of magical realism that borrows from people like C.S. Lewis, um, the epigram at the beginning of the book is from C.S. Lewis, and it's akin to Borges, you know, with its labyrinths and so on. It's, it's a mixing up of time. Um, but again, this literal reading tends to see that in a rather closed world of fantasy literature, as if that was a pleasure, a delight, but doesn't really suggest much more than itself. Um, it uses memory. Um, Piranesi doesn't have a memory. And in this literal reading, memory is seen as a plot device so that as he gradually recovers his memory so the plot can move on. Um, the use of memory in the book is really pivotal so I'm going to return to that as we move to the different levels of understanding it. And so also is the use of statues in the book. The house is full of statues 
and in this literal reading they're seen as sort of echoes of the past. Um, they're just dead memories um, and it's quite striking in the book that there's only one statue described that's actually from the modern world and it's not even from the modern industrial world it's an image of a gorilla um, you know a creature almost extinct as it were um, so statues in this literal reading are just sort of seen as part of the lament part of the melancholy now the book can be read at this level it's fine to read it at this level but it doesn't really work the book doesn't quite let you do this because it's a reductionism that seems to require actually denying the enchantment of the book, the charm of the book. Um, it really goes against the clear thrust of the book. Um, this doesn't fill a book that's a consolation in the face of illness. Um, it's not a lament for the modern world. It's not Ms. Lit. It feels liberating. And so that moves us on to the second level of trying to read it, which is the allegorical level. Now here, the book might be, for example, seen as yet another attempt to live in a utopian world, um, but recognising that attempts to live in utopia are always crashing on themselves, they're sort of haunted by the world they're trying to escape, or in their denial of evil and what's bad, the evil and what's bad um, destroys the world, um, which you know does look like it's going to happen at one point in this book. Um, this is paradise that's actually really a prison you know it's like the desire to want to live forever and ending up getting bored and that's what this second understanding the allegorical the moral the sort of slightly teachy approach to reading this book might suggest um, it's how words and quests can lead to a kind of madness you know Piranesi is sort of on a quest um, being a book it's very interested in words um, but really just makes you mad if you think that can uh, can really help you um, or it treats his memory loss as the result of trauma um, and so wants to understand the trauma and as he recovers his memory the hope is that he might be sort of healed from his trauma now look there's some truth in that but maybe there's other ways to understand memory as well which this allegorical reading doesn't really understand um, more positively the book clearly suggests that kindness matters, that beauty matters, and that we should thank God, um, but also perhaps thank God that we in the real world have progress and so aren't lost in these fantasy worlds. Um, Piranesi says several times, the beauty of the house is immeasurable, immeasurable it's kindness infinite. Um, it's a, a nice chant, a nice incantation, but would you really want to live in a world where that's the best thing you could say about it, the allegorical reading suggests. The statues, um, there are reminders in this allegorical reading, they're not just, as it were, dead echoes from the past, um, they're reminders to be brave, um, as Piranesi once says when he sees the gorilla, or they're reminders to empathise with others, um, in another moment, right at the beginning, Piranesi sees one statue with a bee crawling across the figure's eye and he shivers slightly, wondering what that might be like. These are statues that remind us to empathise with others, this allegorical modern reading, moral reading. Now, again, it's sort of fine, but it doesn't wholly work um, because it feels a bit preachy, whereas the book doesn't actually feel preachy at all. And, and moreover, actually, Piranesi clearly doesn't care about morality. Um, this figure, the other, who is clearly manipulating him, and Piranesi doesn't mind. And you gradually realise he doesn't mind because he's sort of innocent or naive. He doesn't mind because he's got his sights on other things. He's not deluded. And so that takes you to the third way of reading it, which is this tropological or where it starts to unravel you and lead you into a different world, more towards the world that Piranesi himself is occupying. And I think you particularly start to feel that when you consider the differences between Piranesi and the other. For example, the other is interested in a secret knowledge that he believes the house contains, but he's interested in it for reasons of power. He wants to gain that power for himself. Whereas Piranesi too knows that the house contains great knowledge, but he's interested in it for reasons of beauty. And he doesn't think it's secret knowledge to be uncovered. He believes that that knowledge is evident everywhere, if only you can look at it through the eyes of beauty. 
if only things can be seen aright. Another difference between them is that the other has actually given Piranesi his name, um, and it's a joke that the other has, Piranesi, the um, architectural artist who seemed to create labyrinthine worlds out of the buildings um, that he drew, and so um, the other thinks this is a suitable name for Piranesi who lives in this labyrinthine world that is at once a paradise and a prison. Um, now, Piranesi knows that's not his real name, but again, he doesn't mind that the other is having a joke at his expense and without quite understanding the joke, because he knows his real name. He says, my name is beloved of the house, and that's enough for him. He doesn't need a name and doesn't mind when he's called other names. Another difference between the two of them. Um, tides feature a lot in the story. Water rushes through the house periodically. And the other is terrified of them. He's frightened of them. Um, he actually only stays in a few rooms in the house for fear of getting caught out by the tides. But Piranesi understands the tides. He sympathises with them in the sense of being able to relate to them and so actually learns to predict them and know where they're going to go. Um, I think in this tropological reading you might say the tides stand for what we're unconscious of but whereas the other is terrified of his unconscious contents, you might say, and so tries to stay in a small world, Piranesi learns to relate to that which he doesn't immediately understand, and does so by treating it as a living force, knowing that it's animate, and so devises a way of becoming familiar with this other world that's very present, is already here, in his predictions of the tides. Another difference is that the other wants to manipulate people and therefore cares a lot about the machinations with which other people get involved. He's a political creature, um, feels very much like our times. Whole worlds can be formed just by a focus, um, getting lost, becoming obsessed with the machinations of others. Um, Piranesi doesn't mind about that. He knows that others have their motivations, but he is focused on meaning and so it liberates him from the machinations, the politics of the world which the other lives in. This is the reason too that the other cares about names, he wants to identify, he wants to pin down, he wants to be able to locate and so have power over others by giving them names. But Piranesi suspects that names conceal more than they reveal, and in fact he doesn't use names, he's much more inclined just to use descriptions like the other or use numbers, he calls another figure that seems to appear on the scene, the 16, and that actually gives him a lot of flexibility because he can respond to how the person in front of him is in that moment, rather than assuming they're going to be this or that, as a name seems to imply. The other is different in another way. Um, he seeks to recover lost memory. Um, he wants to recover the secret knowledge of the house, whereas Piranesi, um, his lack of memory, I think, isn't so much about a trauma he might have suffered, although it turns out that it is a bit about that, um, but what it does is it liberates him to be in the present. He's not worried about memory because he actually knows that all he needs to know is contained in the present, in what's right in front of him. That gives him his depth of experience because he knows how to look at it aright. He knows that when the birds appear, they will speak to him and he speaks back to the birds. He knows that the statues aren't empty idols, but they're presences and he can speak to those presences. He knows that the world in which we live is full of vitality and in this way he's a bit like, say, indigenous people who relate to the world around them, don't have particular concerns, it seems, in the past or the future. Um, this is the world of Owen Barfield um, that he called original participation. Um, it's a world where what flows into one matters as much as what circulates within one. Um, it's a world that's transparent and porous to the world around, and so sees meaning, knows how to communicate to the world around. Um, that is the, the world um, that Susanna Clarke has said um, she realised was described by Barfield and she's tried to capture in this book. And actually, I, it's why I think the book is much more animated by Barfield than it is, about, than it is by C.S. Lewis, 
although she does give um, a, an epigram from the magician's nephew, nephew at the front of the book, um, I think she realises that um, Barfield captured the spirit of things that then Lewis tried to put down in his stories. And um, she does that, I think, in a hint that she gives at one point in the book, because there's a moment where Piranesi um, has a sort of vision in which he sees a white cross forming in front of him. And for a moment, you think this is an allusion to the Christian cross and the white light of divine revelation. But then it turns out that the cross changes again and becomes an albatross and the great white bird flies into one of the halls. And then what's really interesting is that um, Pyrenees, he tends to the albatross, he helps it build its nest. Now, I think this must be an allusion to um, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, Coleridge's great pro poem, where, of course, the albatross is ultimately killed. Um, the ancient mariner can't tolerate its presence um, in this awful act, a mindless act. Well, Pyrenees does quite the opposite. Um, he knows that the albatross, that imagination, really matters, and he's going to tend it and live with it because it gives him life. Um, in Christian terms, this is William Blake's understanding that the cross is not about salvation, the cross is about incarnation. As Blake put it, Christ is the imagination. And so I think that this book is leading us towards this Barfieldian, William Blake, um, Coleridgean um, perception of things. It's an important work in that sense of romantic literature, realising that that's about the tropological moment where we're taken into other worlds that are already here because it cultivates our perception. Um, just another difference between the other and Piranesi, you know, the, the other belongs to a sort of cult, it turns out, um, and as cults are often, um, he's very interested in power um, and so it drags him down, it turns into a vicious spiral that drags him down. Um, you might say that he gains a world, um, the world of the halls, um, but he loses his soul. Um, and whereas Piranesi um, doesn't seek to gain a world at all, he knows that the world is already his as much as it is him. Um, and so he finds his soul. Um, he doesn't belong to a cult. He's free of such things. Um, he knows about meaning and he doesn't care about power. It's interesting to the book because it's about theurgy. Um, and the other uses a theogistic right um, to access other worlds, to gain his power, um, so that he can move between worlds, um, and he thinks that's his freedom. Um, whereas I think Piranesi knows that theurgy is actually about achieving a different state of consciousness that you can become aligned to. It's a state of consciousness where reason serves the imagination. It's a state of consciousness that can see into the inside of things and sense their vitality, not just try to understand so as to manipulate and control things. Um, Piranesi regards himself as a scientist. He says, I'm a scientist, but he's a scientist of contemplation. He's a scientist that dwells in wonder and seeks to deepen his wonder. He's not a scientist that tries to produce technologies that can manipulate, shape, control, um, you know, perhaps try to make the world better. Piranesi that knows that the world is already perfect if he can see it aright. And another way that Susanna Clarke is inviting us to make this change is by alluding to Plato's cave, but in a very fascinating way, because in one way the house is like Plato's cave, um, and we're aware there's an outside world and there's this question of whether Piranesi is going to be able to find that outside world. Um, the house is also built of marble, the statues are, are built of marble, and this is a kind of nod to how we imagine platonic reality as if it's made of crystalline, pristine white marble. Um, but it's much more sophisticated than that because Piranesi also says that um, he knows of the outside world because what's in the house, what's in all these halls, shares in the reality of the outside world. The statues and the house is as real as the outside world. And this is the real lesson of Plato's cave, that when we can understand that all things share in a common being, then we can know that whatever we look at tells us about everything else too. 
This is why he speaks to the birds, why he speaks to the tides, why he converses with the dead who are present. A small handful of dead people are present. Um, you know, the dead are, are sort of liminal. Um, he tends to them, he feeds them. Um, and he's constantly living from the inside out as well as from the outside in. This is the real meaning, meaning I think, of Plato's cave, which Susanna Clarke understands fully. Um, it's not about an escape so much as it's about a realisation of what's already present. This true Platonism is particularly revealed in how Perinesi understands memory and how he understands the statues. So memory is seen as a recollection of what is present, a seeing into what's around and understanding its being. It's not about trying to hold on to the past or predict the future. And also in relation to the statues, it draws, I think, a lot on the ancient theogestic understanding of statues. Um, this was the theurgy devised within Neoplatonism particularly, and it understood that statues are living things. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the kind of magic that makes statues alive, um, a bit like the winter's tale. Um, but properly understood, this theurgy actually is not about something magical. It's about a realisation. And so it doesn't just see statues as kind of dead artworks, as echoes of the past. Neither does it see statues as teaching signs, as if they would encourage you to be brave um, or to have sympathy with others. It understands that when you participate in the life of the statue, when you, as it were, imaginatively let its presence infiltrate into your presence when you, as it were, imagine maybe the statue speaking to you or um, you speaking to the statue, when you start to participate in the being of the statue, then you realise that actually you share its being. And that's the way in which the statues actually live. This is to say that they are not idols in the empty sense, but idols in the sense of transmitting the divine presence. Um, you know, we still treat statues in that way, in fact. Um, when people want to tear down statues or when people would feel it be absolutely unthinkable to remove a statue, like maybe say the, the Statue of Liberty, it's because they know that they would lose contact with the presence that's in the statue as much as it's in the world around them. And this is how the Neoplatonists understood theurgy. Incidentally, it's also very, very different from new thought the idea that you can call the cosmos down to your ends, um, as you know, as if you can kind of manipulate it um, by a kind of cosmic magic, um, the so-called new thought um, present in books like The Secret. Um, no, this is the kind of theurgy that's actually about you waking up to that which is already there, knowing that your being shares in the being of all things around you, and so being able to live from that shared sympathy, from that common perception. That's why this is a kind of theogistic liberation, not an attempt, again, to manipulate or control. So in this tropological zone, we are in the book now. We're participating in the life of the book, much as Piranesi is participating in the life of the house, and it's calling forth from us, what do we see? And that takes us to the fourth level of hermeneutical um, interpretation, the anagogic from the divine perspective, which I think the book can give us as well. This realises that the house is not a prison. Um, it's not even actually a portal to paradise. It's actually an experience of paradise already. Um, in the book, the mundane world um, is actually the prison because it sees itself as a closed system. It doesn't even believe in the imagination beyond offering consoling fantasies or maybe telling us how morally to be a little bit better. Um, this is the book, the house, our minds, as already participating in the fullness of all things. It's the imaginal world rather than just empty fantasies, it's sometimes put. There's no memory in a way because everything is fully present. You just have to look. Everything has meaning if you know how to speak to it, if you know how to converse with it, because everything shares in its own way, with its own reflections, in its own manifestation, with the being that is one in all things. We can converse with them when we bring our minds and our hearts together, when we bring our inquiry with our imagination, when we build the sense of things and so are able to share in it consciously, self-consciously, 
um, as seems to be the gift that we human beings have. The tides, along with everything else in the world, aren't primarily understood as machines, but as organisms that can be related to as part of the whole, doing their own thing within that whole, as indeed we are. It's the science of wonder, not of power. Always, everywhere, for Piranesi, awareness matters. And he knows that as he brings his awareness to the world, it shines and beams into that world as the world shines and beams back into him. That is the source of his vitality. His busyness, he's always busy, but it's not an obsession. It's not about counting things in order to try and control things. It's actually a meditative act. It's how he takes his curiosity into the world so that the world can reveal itself to him. And his precision, he's very interested in numbering things, the number of the halls, where they are and so on. Again, this is not neurotic, I think. It's about clear sightedness. He is trying to understand the essence of things and it's reductionism in that sense, not so as to strip it back, but so he can understand its plenitude by understanding the heart of its being, which he feels within his own being. He knows he owns nothing in this world, and that means that he owns everything because he's part of everything. He knows that in a way he's empty, but it's an emptiness that's constantly able to receive, and so is a kind of fullness. That is this anagogic state of mind as well. He's beyond even saving or grace. Um, towards the end of the book, there's a kind of opportunity for him to receive grace and for him to be saved, but he doesn't understand the point of it because he already knows that he's part of this infinity and there can be nothing outside of the infinity of the house. That's the definition of infinity, if there was an outside that needed saving, that needed the grace in order to be saved, it would mean there was something outside of the world, outside of God. And of course, he knows there's nothing outside of God. Um, he's not alone either. He's not actually in solitude. It is the kind of awareness that knows he's part of the plenitude, which is found within himself as well as within everything else around him. He's not innocent. Um, he's wise. He's not like a child in the sense of being infantile. He's like the child in the sense of being present to all things. And that is the source of his wisdom. He feels free even as the world around him crumbles because the halls are crumbling and the rain breaks in, the birds can fly in through broken windows. But he's not anxious about that because he's not morally anxious. He's not like the other who wants to understand things in order to try and control it, maybe even to rebuild it. And he's not like He's not bothered by the other's manipulation of him because he's not bothered about moral concerns. He knows, most shockingly for the earlier levels of understanding, that both pleasure and suffering can be attended to alike because they're engaged fully, but with a kind of detachment that rests on the understanding that all things share this common life. He can say yes to absolutely everything as we learn when the other tries to manipulate him and Piranesi just accepts it. He even keeps caring for the other in the other's lost world of manipulation. He can say yes to everything and so that is another key source of his freedom. When I think of the, the hidden meanings and messages perhaps of Susanna Clarke's book that it's possible to free, be free even as you feel the world crumbling around you. The house is immeasurable and infinite in beauty and kindness. This is the divine within. Um, it's the being within which he lives and moves and has his being. And so the book sort of stirs our desire to know this world. We want to understand the book, you know, what's the key, what's the secret behind it. But ultimately, I think as Piranesi realizes in his own world, there is no key, there is no secret behind it because the desire is in fact our experience of this desiring world that just desires to be known, it desires to be kind, that's why it's immeasurable, that's why it's infinite. And when we can realise that, as it were, we can realise the consciousness of Piranesi too, which is the consciousness that all the great mystics and the wisdom traditions tell us 
It's what Dante sees at the end of the paradise, that there's no objects in God. Everything shares in the subjectivity of God. And so everything knows that it moves with the love that turns the sun and the other stars. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to be discovered. There's everything to see when, like Piranesi, we might know that we're always already within the divine.